Welcome everyone to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. I'm really excited today. This has been a short turnaround, but I've been in touch with a beautiful woman named Madeline Black, who is a psychotherapist. So I'm, I'm, we're going to go into that zone a little bit. But she's a speaker uh, and she's the author of a book titled Unbroken. We're so pleased to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much, Petra. Lovely to be here too. So, so good to have you. So um, fill in the blanks a little bit for our listeners. Let them know uh, what, what is it that you're passionate about at the moment? Well, I am passionate about speaking out, about helping people to find their voice, to by sharing my story, to inspire them to know that it's never too late to get help and to recover from our past so we can live in our present. I, oh, I love that so much because uh, my story is definitely about spending a good decade feeling stuck in the past and in a victim place and having dealt with trauma myself. So I'm very interested in your journey and the things that, that you've learned. Madeline, give, give our listeners just a little bit of context to what it was like growing up for you. Do you think that your, your sort of parents or the education system prepared you for, you know, life in the real world, built your resilience? Actually, I do, and I often wonder if I was born to different parents, how I would have come out of what happened to me. My father was a Holocaust survivor. Oh, my goodness. And my mum had her neck broken in an operation and was bedridden for a couple of years. So my mum fought back from not really being able to walk, look after herself, and determined to start looking after her five kids. And my dad... Um, not by what he said, but how he lived his life. He showed me that it's really possible to get past anything that happened to us in life because he lost his parents, his brothers and sisters, his youngest brother, Mordechai, was just six years old when he was gassed along with the rest of the family. And I saw that actually you can enjoy life again despite the massive traumas. And what happened to me, I thought, well, if my dad can get past all of that, surely I can get past this as well. So they... He was really my best teacher in life, I would say. Well, that's incredible in, in just in general, because they do talk about generational trauma, don't they? Um, affecting generations that perhaps haven't witnessed uh, the trauma themselves. But it sounds like your dad did a good job of trying to break that cycle. Uh, absolutely. And he, he used to say if this hadn't happened, he wouldn't have met my mum. He wouldn't have had five of us. So he always had a spin. And if you met him, you'd never know. I mean, he just mucked about so much. He really? was like a big child and he laughed a lot. And, you know, for a while I could never understand his laughter, but now I see that was his strength to still be able to see the goodness because his sister survived as well, my aunt. And she had chronic schizophrenia, agoraphobia, obsessive compulsive disorder. She never went out. If she did go out, she wanted to go home straight away. If she heard a motorbike, she'd call us and say the Gestapo are outside her flat oh coming to take her away. Yeah. So she was very much living in her trauma. And my dad grew from his trauma. He had post-traumatic growth. So, uh, yeah, I'm very lucky that I had them. And what do you think it is? I'm just getting clinical for a second, because literally a couple of weeks ago, we had on a guy who experienced PTSD himself. And what do you think is the difference either within the person, their character or their history or the way their mindset that creates that difference between distress and growth? I don't know, because I'm actually part of a program at the moment called the Resilience, the Global Resilience Project, which oh, wow. is started by Emma Bell. She's taken 50 of us and we've all had very different stories. But we've all overcome something huge. And she wants to see exactly like you, what it is that we all possess. And she's come up with nine different elements of our characters or personalities. We don't do all of the nine, but we all do some of them. And I'm really intrigued to get her research. I think it will be a book, maybe a documentary or a film. So it's really interesting. And she wants to use it for mental health. She wants to spread it to as many people as possible. I think she's got 10 million people in mind and she wants to use it in businesses and just to help people, you know, to better themselves. But I don't know where my resilience comes from. I'd like to think from my parents or my mindset, but yeah, it's really hard to know what came first. It's just fascinating because I'm one of five siblings as well. And okay. we were, we were raised in a religious cult and okay. it left at different times and had different levels of, of trauma, both before and after. And it's very interesting to see how we're each coping or how we, the meaning that we create from it. Because it sounds like your, your dad very much created, found a sense of meaning. I wouldn't have Absolutely. met your, your mum had, had this not happened or things like that. And there's, there's this sense of how you package it, so to speak, or if you practice having a growth mindset. 
Um, sounds like when that research is out, we're going to have to have her on the show as yeah. well. <laughs> and also, I now wouldn't undo what happened to me at 13. And that, that's maybe hard for people to understand when they hear my story, but it, it's a paradox because it's made me who I am, and yet I'm not that what happened to me. So it's both things, but it, the journey that it's put me on, it woke me up. You know, I, don't, I wonder what I would be like if that hadn't happened to me. And that's interesting because the theme often that comes from these podcast interviews is that wake up moment or a catalyst moment or something that's so disruptive that forces people to sort of sink or swim, you know, uh, to begin to survive or, or begin to thrive. So let's go to your story. Um, and, and I know it's, it's, it's in the book and uh, I know a little bit about it, but, uh, give us a bit of context about what happened at 13. Yep. So it was the late 1970s. And as I said, I was 13 years old and I was gang raped by two American teenagers. Um, a girlfriend and I came up with a plan to have a night out to buy some alcohol and meet some boys. We both lied about where we were staying. Her mother was away. So we went back to her mum's empty flat. We managed to buy some alcohol, which we drank in a local cafe. I was 13, half the size I am now, having never drunk before. So I got drunk very, very quickly. And in fact, I threw up all over the place. And so these two young men put us in a black taxi and took us back to her mum's empty flat. And it became very clear very early on that they weren't there to let me sleep off the sick, that they were there for something else. Mm. Um, horrific. I've got a 15 year old son and a 12 year old daughter. So just thinking about that age range and the, the sort of helplessness within that situation. So obviously it was a very traumatic night. Can you talk us through sort of the, the what next? Well, it's interesting because the night was very traumatic and it lasted for about four or five hours. But my journey has always been about getting my memories back because I know now that our mind shuts things off. But literally in the morning, I woke up with lots of injuries on my body, not knowing how I had got them because wow. my mind just numbed it. And I spent a lot of years in numbness, not feeling, not thinking, not eating, not speaking. I realize now that what we don't speak about leaks out of us. And it, it leaked out of me in so many ways. I anorexia, I used drugs, alcohol, just to numb out, not feel, not think. I became very promiscuous, which I know is a normal side effect from being raped. I thought, well, the worst has already happened and I didn't want it to get violent, so I would let them do whatever they wanted. And then I became very suicidal. I didn't understand the purpose of being me or the point of even being alive. And I tried unsuccessfully, obviously, to end my life woke up in hospital. I didn't even know my stomach had been pumped. I took so many drugs and I ended up in a children's psychiatric ward for about two months when I was 14. So that and was a really quick succession in the sense of a, a year's time, that sort of debilitating spiral. And But you weren't able to connect the dots at, at that age. Uh, you just shut it all down. Yeah. And I had had a little bit of contact with this psychiatrist before because when I was about 11, I had an electric epileptic fit because I, at that time I thought my mom was going to die so the family went for therapy so when I went back to see the same psychiatrist he assumed that it was the same issue that we had left when I was just 11 a couple of years later and one of the things I did when I wrote my memoir was I asked my hospital notes which was a very interesting read but I wanted to see if they had any idea why I turned into this girl overnight who couldn't speak or couldn't eat and hated herself and yeah. they had no idea. So they weren't any concerned with my anorexia and my depression just filled me full of antidepressants. And that, I think that's relevant for so many people is just that those things as symptoms of something that you're so shameful of or not even able to picture or remember. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just lazy medicine, you know, really just assuming or that it was just the same incident as before, and that I uh, just hope that things have changed for people, that they oh, can recognize the signs of trauma. Absolutely. I think there's probably inconsistency there, but, um, but hope. Uh, there, there are some good practitioners. So, so, so then what happened? I, obviously, you're in a place now where you've got a book out and you're speaking and, and you, you know, you're very visible and you've obviously done some work to get here. Talk us Just a like, bit. Yeah, yeah. So 14, you're admitted to a psychiatric uh, a institution uh, for, for a little bit of time. So, I mean, would that have been your rock bottom moment? 
oh no, it got worse. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so when, I, when I left hospital, I put on some weight so because I, they thought I was in for anorexia and depression. They let me out. Yeah. And then my parents discovered that I was smoking a lot more dope than they realized. And my mum did the worst thing any parent could do. She called all my friends' mums and told them what we were up to. Ooh. So at that point... Uh, it adds to the shame, nobody right? Nobody was speaking to me because they all got into so much trouble. So my parents suggested to go away for a year, uh, you know, to, just to get away. And I agreed because I thought well, nobody's speaking to me. I would put on my uniform, pretend to go to school, sit in the park all day, smoke myself silly with joints, drugs, and then come back at the end of the day. So I, I was just, that really was my worst point, I would say. And would you say that you, at this point, that, because I think you said you were out with a friend that night, uh, that you uh, had other friendships beforehand. Did you try to tell anyone? Were you even able to, to know for yourself? Or Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting when the book came out, one of my friends said, you know, you did tell me, and I didn't remember telling her, and she did tell me that that was rape, and I just, I, I never called what happened to me rape, because I had locked it so far out of my head that I could remember bits of it, the beginning bit, but I couldn't remember all the details, that would take a long time for all those memories to come back. So yeah, I didn't really tell anyone, because one of the very last things that I did remember is that the one I called the worst one, he held his knife against my throat and said, if I tell anyone, then he'll kill me. And I believed him. And they had already used the knife on me as well. So I did believe him. So you've got the threat and the fear, but also yeah. the shame. I know a lot of us women have the shame of, you know, we've gone for a night out. We've got some alcohol in our system. Is it our fault? I say this from personal perspective. I was raped uh, oh, at yeah. 18. I completely um, blamed myself yeah. for years. And even then at 13... How did I know about victim blaming messages before the internet, before social media, but it was still out there. And I thought, well, what will people think? Like you say, I had been drinking. I lied about where I was staying. We'd gone out. My mum was ill at home and I'm out drinking. My friend's flat was empty. Her mum was away. I brought it on myself. It was my fault. And that shit can we can carry with us for decades and some people Absolutely. never let it go. Absolutely. I spoke once at a conference at Northampton University and just after me there was a woman who spoke about trauma and the impact it could have on our body and she spoke about shame and she said trying to keep our shame hidden is like constantly keeping a beach ball under the water and that just was like oh my oh. god that was me for years. But then to go back to what you said before the way it's coming out is doesn't seem directly connected to the trauma to an untrained eye. It's yeah. physical health issues. It's other psychological things. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's I was not... just a, you know, a troublesome adolescent in their eyes, which I guess I could have those symptoms as well. But I'd like to now think what's behind those issues. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. No, there's definitely uh, you trying to understand the why or help a young person to understand the why. Um, yeah. So so you're holding on to your shame. You're not remembering things. Things are pretty much spiraling out of control. How did it develop from there? Well, there was another piece of the jigsaw as well. I had gone out one night after my parents said not to go out. And my mum, when I came home at 6, 7 in the morning, is screaming at me, shaking me, saying, don't you know what can happen? And I'm thinking, well, the worst has already happened, but I still couldn't find it. So I wrote a little note, which I left on my pillow before I went to school, just briefly outlining the details. And when I came back, they said, is it true? And I said, yes. So they called the other girl involved. She denied it all. She said it ha hadn't happened like I said it had happened. They were nice boys because they were sons of diplomats. And they just took us home and left us there. And they didn't do what they said. And in, in that moment, I just felt so betrayed. It just, maybe that was actually my worst point. <laughs> that was really the worst point. Well, I think. well, did you question yourself then in that moment of her betraying that the story? You know, at that point, I was really not communicating great. I'd really sure. kind of selective mutual, I suppose, and I really just was grumpy. I wasn't really, yeah. you know, communicating, speaking very well. And I'm saying, yes, it did happen. My dad wanted to go to the police, and I was terrified of going to the police. It was three years later anyway. And my mum was really, really quiet, and I misunderstood her silence for years. I thought she didn't believe me. But it took me many, many years to hear her story which was when she was eight, she was raped by a neighbor. Oh. And she had never told my dad. She'd had five children. So when I'm 
sharing my story of rape, she's confronted by all her trauma, and she can't say anything because my dad never knew. So she's saying, no, she shouldn't go to the police because she'd had to be examined at eight years old and she knew how awful it was. So she's trying to protect me without revealing her story. So it was a very hard time for me and for her as well. So she's essentially being triggered by, you know, the, the whole her personal thing, but also not being able to protect you, perhaps, and is in a way shutting down in order to cope yeah. and go into survival mode. But you're a kid going, um, shit, she doesn't believe me, and dad wants to do this, and that's terrifying. So not necessarily the feeling of sort of support and the things that maybe you felt you needed at the time. Yeah. And then it was around that time they discovered I was smoking loads of dope. And then she called all my friends' parents and they said, go away. And I just thought, oh, gee, I've got, what have I got to lose? So I went to Israel for a year. Okay. With your and family? With myself when okay. I was 17. Um, I went with a group of young people as well. I spent six months on a kibbutz and six months in a town called Ashkelon. And about a month before the end of my year, I met a blonde, blue-eyed Glaswegian called Stephen, 35 years ago, who is now my husband. And he was the first man that ever really I trusted that I felt safe. And that sounds a very weird word to use, but it was about my safety. My, my main fears and phobias, which I had many, were really around men and feeling safe, my own personal security. Um, so, yeah, when I got back from my year away, he still wanted to see me. And I couldn't understand why he would want to be with me because my self-worth was so low. I you hated really yourself, I, yeah. Yeah, I was. I thought I was worthless, still dirty, contaminated. I couldn't understand why he would want to be with me, and I would drive him mad, asking why. Why could you possibly love me? What do you see in me? And he just was so solid and grounded, and just said he just loved me. And actually, through his love, that really started my healing journey. I saw that not only was I lovable, that I could also give love back, and I could learn to slowly love myself. I bet that was an intense, long journey yeah. of learning. <laughs> and I think now I know love is always going to win over hate, always. Uh, and I imagine that just the other side around intimacy and um, post-traumatic stress in whatever way that was showing up for you, learning to understand what was happening and have some yeah. self-compassion. It was awful. At times, Stephen's face would turn into their face and I'd have to push him off or I'd be crying or in the middle of the night uh, having nightmares or yeah being intimate making love that's really when I would get quite triggered please to say that doesn't happen anymore so so yeah let's talk recovery because you now have a secure base so to speak so somebody who's who's there for you and you're you're pushing against it but it's consistent it's consistently yeah. there so I can see the, the healing properties you've also you've also ended up studying some of this stuff and, and learning about it so what sent you in, in the direction of psychotherapy and working with people in that way? Yeah, I think actually my dad's experience, I was always so interested before this happened to me, how can my dad come out so okay, my aunt Eva come out really, really not okay? Right. And I wanted to understand how we can all have a same or similar experience, but we respond very differently. And I do believe it's not what happens to us that is important, but it's what we do with what happens to us. And you know, like, I could have two clients, maybe they've both lost their father, they're yeah. both grieving, and one will say, I'm never going to ever get over losing my dad, and one can say, I'm so grateful that I had that man as my father. You know, our attitude is everything. And that, that always intrigued me. No, well, it is fascinating. I remember reading Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning and just his whole approach on, on attitude, response, meaning what is in our control. I mean... Yeah revolutionary when you've experienced trauma and of course that's a whole other level quite connected to maybe some of your father's story um, yeah my dad said he always had hope and he said he could go days and days and days without food but he never went without hope oh beautiful and i guess our rock bottom moments are often the ones where we feel like the hope has dissipated a little bit yeah i never saw a way out i just thought i was always going to end up this depressed you know woman that had no future no hope felt so worthless hated herself but you can you can really get out of it well did you do you remember having a single moment where it's never a single moment but a moment where you thought actually i need to put the work in or there is some kind of absolutely. hope absolutely when i first met Stephen, i told him i would never become a mum 
because I thought that giving birth was going to be like being raped again. I had these images of my feet in stirrups, men at my vagina, and I just, it freaked me out. And oh. so I don't know why I live in Scotland, but I do, mm. but I love the sunshine. But we would take all our annual leave, and every winter we'd go away for three, four weeks. And one particular moment, we had been in Thailand for about three, four weeks, and we were on an island called Koh Phi Phi, and he is asking me the usual question of how about starting a family and I'm already with my usual response of Stephen you know why I can't do that and I don't know what it was but something came in to me and I just thought to myself if I never become a mum then they've won I'm giving all my power and control to these two young men and I don't want to do that anymore and there and then I thought I'm going to become a mother I made that decision and I also decided that I would just refuse to be identified by what had happened to me and I would live my life as best as I could. And it was there and then that I came up with a plan that I called my best revenge. And I went on to have three beautiful daughters. Oh my goodness. I've got so that literally really was a huge turning point for me. I've got an image on my phone that I see all the time that says the best revenge is living a good life. Absolutely. Um, so I feel like we're quite aligned in, uh, um, you know, how we channeled maybe the pain and the trauma into it started off a bit aggressively for me and like proving people wrong. Um, but it then, you know, shifted to more of a compassionate, like, well, me living my best self wins every time. Yep. Um, you mentioned during that moment that you, you talked to Stephen and said, uh, you, you know, that you know why, uh, I can't do this. So presumably you'd, you'd been piecing some memories together and yeah. he knew. He knew, he knew that I'd been raped and I, I started to call it rape then, but he didn't know all the details till many years later when I finally found a way to tell him. And so how did you go through that process of piecing things together? Did you end up getting psychotherapy or trauma oh, therapy? Or? Of therapy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we have to in our training, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so when I came back from Thailand, I wanted to become a mum, so I had to go to therapy because I was so scared, I was so fearful, and I also had fears of injections and any internals, procedures, dentists, I couldn't let anybody put anything inside me. Mm. I got past that. And for me, a lot of my work has been through my body because the trauma is, is caught in our cells, it's in our body, so I've done a lot of body work, therapeutic massage. The very first time I went... I was on the couch and I heard this person screaming, shouting, crying, kicking. And I thought, where is this coming from? And I realized it was me. And it was just like, I could not believe that all that was inside me. This was at a point when my eldest daughter, Anna, turned 13. And I was also studying psychotherapy. Then I was doing lots of personal development courses. And she was the same age that I was when I was raped. So... I now know the memories are always going to come back, mm. that they started to come back. I started to have nightmares, flashbacks, memories, pictures all the time. And I went back to, again for therapy and I told my therapist, I want you to take these memories away. The worst kind of clients I didn't want to see them. <laughs> Fix <because> me. <laughs> yeah, it was like a porn film in my head and I was a star in the film. And I thought, you know, I worked at Women's Aid for 14 years. I worked at Rape Crisis for six years. I thought maybe I've just heard lots of people's stories and I had mm. absorbed their stories. I did not want to believe that these images were actually me, that they were real. And I had about three years then of therapy and actually I saw my denying the memories were actually keeping me in the memories. You know, the more I just resisted it, and couldn't believe it, didn't want to believe it, two people could be so violent towards another human being it kept those memories just churning and they would just come in all the time so that was a really tough time and it's now 25 so that was like 12 years ago and very near to the end actually something completely flipped me again my therapist had said to me you know maybe these two guys weren't born rapists and I was like how dare he say that to me you know I was so full of hate revenge and anger for years I fantasized about somebody kidnapping them taking them to an empty flat tying them up beating them up torturing them and raping them for four or five hours like they had done to me but he planted a seed in my head and I found myself wanting to understand how could these two young men behave so violently towards another human being and I saw that in their dehumanizing of me they're only dehumanizing themselves. They weren't connected into their goodness, their source, their hara, whatever you want to call it. And somehow, out of nowhere, 
I found myself full of compassion for them, then I found myself forgiving them. And that has been the thing that has really allowed me just to let go of everything. I, I had to find a way to accept and acknowledge that all those things did happen to me and whatever they had seen, heard, experienced, conditioned them in their life. And I thought, you know, I really made an effort to clean up my trauma and have a good life. But they have to live with what they did to me. And I can't imagine that would be easy. I have to delve into this piece because <laughs> um, radical forgiveness, there, there's a lot out there in personal development circles just about the, the healing properties of it. Uh, it can feel a little bit religious if you've got that sort of background. It also feels like a myth, like it can, like, how do you grasp on to this idea of forgiveness to yeah, these? Yeah, I guess I'm an accidental forgiver, though. Oh, you're an accidental forgiver. <laughs> I never really intended to. <laughs> yeah, oops. <laughs> but, but just slow that down for a little bit. Like, how, I, I get that you, the guy planted the seed and then you sort of, a thought process began and you've done so much personal development work as well. So this is all like little steps, isn't it? It's never, because I just like to challenge the, the listeners who think that some people can and some people can't. This was, it was such a huge process. And before that, yes, I spoke about therapy. I had body therapy. I went to transformational breath work. I used to do sweat lodges. I did some very strange things. Like I took San Pedro, which is a plant, a bit like ayahuasca. Yeah. So I've done a lot. And then I put myself into situations where I confronted my fears because my fears were men and being out of control. So I now do karate, I do windsurfing. When I worked as a client, I was terrified of male clients. So then I asked Oni to send me male clients. So I challenged my fears because Whoa. I saw my fears weren't real. They were all based on what had happened to me and what could happen to me. So that my fears were my imagination. But that took a long time for me to work that out. I mean, but 30 what, years, 40 years. Right, right. Like half a lifetime, right. But what I love hearing is this sort of proactive approach in the sense of facing your fears. And I realize that you that's a very gradual process. But there is times when we can have experienced trauma or symptoms around uh, mental health issues that might be about something else. And I think we can get attached to our labels and kind of be like, well, I've had a traumatic incident. Don't expect me to have male clients, for example, or be in these sorts of relationships. And we can put, not help ourselves well, by yes, putting... I did that for a long time. Well, of course, because you have yeah, to protect yourself. Say, it's only women. Yeah, well, it is, but you worked yeah. with it with trauma and domestic abuse victims, yeah. it sounds like. I did, yes, but so it was were... safe in the room because I was only with female clients. I worked at Rape Crisis. It was only female clients again. I knew that I could hear horrible stories. Yeah, which could re-trigger in a different way. present for the, my client. I knew that I could listen, but I didn't put myself in front of a man for many years. And so, but, but I would just really want people to hear that the approach of when, when you feel safe and when you feel supported and you've done, done the bits of work, like don't stop there. Beginning to face your fears and actually show up at life is really the best, uh, sort of yeah. revenge if we're to use that word. Um, what's the difference that forgiveness has made in the life that you lead or the relationships that you have? Well, I am no longer friends with fear. We fell out. I've got rid of fear. You know, mm. I would get in my car, put the buttons down. If I got to a car park, I'd kind of run to the exit. If I saw a man in the street, I would cross the road. It just, it affected every, every part of my, my life, my awakeness. Um, I don't think about fear at all anymore. I do karate, I'm black belt, but there's mainly 40, 50 guys, maybe two or three women. It does not bother me in the slightest, you know. I worked with one male client uh, who had been raped at 13, and I saw... Through him, he taught me so much. I think people think that our, as therapists, we, oh, no. kinds of things. we always so learn. Much. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and so I saw what his reaction, his shaking, his all of it, the shame, the guilt, the denial, it was just like me. And I saw actually it through him, he was just a human being. He wasn't a man having been raped. He was another human. And working with men really just diluted my fears that I, I have. I have known the worst of men and I've known the best of men. So it's balancing that out and not sort of hyper-focusing on, on the trigger. Yeah, I, you know, Stephen was a good man, but I thought every other man, was always he was always a potential rapist or someone's going to harm me and in some way, but I don't see that now, actually. And paradoxically, most of the people that have helped me have been men. 
That's incredible. Um, and so you finding your own balance around interactions with men and dealing with trauma is um, excellent and amazing and you're leading a good life. But and you're now speaking on stages and you have a book out. So like, how did you then go, let me actually share this story with the world? <laughs> like, yeah, so what? I was going to a workshop uh, run by a man called Imaho, who is, a, I guess you would call him a shaman. So he's like a teacher of life, but he does... Uh, two tours in Europe, and I often go to the two tours in Glasgow, then I started to travel overseas more, and he knew my story, and he said it'd be a really good idea for me to write it down, and I said, no way, I know you well, but <laughs> I don't up. want you to read it, <laughs> yeah. no way, and about, I would stop and start it, and about four years later, literally, the words just came pouring out of my fingertips, and he, I told him I had written it, and he said, oh, great, I'd love to read it, so I very mm. scarily emailed it to him. And then he phoned me and said he'd like to use it in one of his workshops. I said, what do you mean? What are you going to do with it? He said, I want people to see how, yes, we can have a huge trauma, but how we can also walk it out. He said, what you've done is quite unusual, the place that you're at now. And he, he wants to show people that also people that have had a sheltered life that don't know anything about trauma, you know, what it is to walk something through. And I, I trusted him, so I thought, okay, but his, I said that he had to call me afterwards and let me know how it went. This took place in Switzerland. I wasn't there. I was in Glasgow. And while he was speaking, I could see all my words going around, flying around in my mind. I thought, he's let me read what I wrote. And I messaged him and we spoke and I said, did you let me read? He said, yeah, it was really good for the moment. Oh no, I could never ever walk back into a workshop again. He said it was really good for them. And I, I was just, mortified of course it's what and we I call listened. a like a vulnerability hangover oh, right <laughs> so vulnerable and i listened to the recording because they're taped over and over and over again and it made me shake it made me feel sick it was just awful <laughs> so the next workshop for me was in cork in ireland and before i went i decided to go back even though i said i could never return i did decide to turn uh, i didn't know that he told people not to tell anyone not to speak to me about it just to leave her alone and you know respect her space so when I walked in, people kind of looked down at their shoes and ignored me. Oh. And I, I just felt like I was walking in naked. And I thought, they know everything about me, all my most intimate details, because he said to write all the details down. But then gradually, it's a four-day workshop, people started to speak to me, and I saw the power of sharing our stories. People, men and women that had been raped, but other people that hadn't had that trauma, had had other traumas or people, one man in particular, and I thought, gosh, how did he get that from my story? He had been scammed by a business partner and he was holding on to anger all of his life. And then he saw if I could forgive that, he needs to let that go. He saw how it was hurting him and his current business and his current wife. And he chose to let it go as well. And I just thought, gosh, this is what Imaho meant, how it's now going to help other people. On a much so, bigger scale than you could have even yeah. imagined, the type of people who can benefit. Yeah, so then, um, because the idea of forgiveness was in my head, I researched the Forgiveness Project, and I was on their Facebook page, and just commenting a few things, and the founder, Marina, got in contact with me and said she'd like to share my story on her website. I sent her these 12 pages, which we edited quite a lot, and I still took out more details than she wanted to keep in. I just thought, no, I can't put that in. Sure. And it... I just was contacted by so many people. Well, that was about four and a half years ago. Had the same experience, telling me that I was brave, I was courageous. And I thought, I don't want to be brave. I want this to be okay that we can share the difficult things as well as the good things. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be courageous that I can speak about rape. Um, but I saw she calls us story healers instead of storytellers. And I have felt that over and over again, the power that comes when we share our stories. Amazing. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm translating some of this and I'm imagining, I'm imagining so many people in my generation who were raised in the way that I was with so many different types of trauma. Um, and how so many of us are still stuck in this place of sort of victimhood or obviously doing the best we can under ridiculous circumstances. But, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years on, still feeling like that's such a big part of our story. And there's something so liberating about forgiving our parents for, for raising us in that environment, for forgiving. 
And I'm not sure I've gotten right to the point of forgiving the founder and, you know, the cult leader and, and, you know, for, for some of the stuff, like his son ended up killing someone and killing himself, um, who was our age and like our brother, you know, so there's layers to this. I've certainly found forgiveness for, for my parents, but I'm just, anyway, I'm just picturing some of, some of our, some of my guys, uh, watching this and knowing how powerful your story is, uh, which it's is. It's a process. It is a process, yeah. It's not, I didn't get here overnight. Absolutely, it's a process. Yeah, and so we're therapists, so we get what process means, but I guess I want to translate that. And so a process means that it can take time, it takes introspection, it often takes external help, it takes books, it takes, what what else? Just, just, it takes. Well, I, I kind of, I like to speak in visual terms. If you think of a lift that's at the hundredth floor, it's just slowly coming down, you know, a floor at a time until eventually you're not even, you know, for a long time, maybe you hover at four flat, floor number five, that was a tricky one to say, <laughs> or you get to floor three and then you get to the ground floor, but then I feel like I'm in my basement and now I'm solid and I'm grounded and I'm back to where I'm meant to be. I'm rooted back in this planet because for a long time, you know, the night that it happened, I know that I left my body because I was watching the scene from on top of the wardrobe while it was all taking place. So for a long time, I never felt in. Mm. So a lot of my work, like I said, has been through my body because the trauma is held in our cells and I've felt that from all the weird and wonderful different therapies that I've tried. So I had to get back in my body and actually accepting all, knowing I can't change it as much as I hate it, that's what's helped me. Acceptance, forgiveness, going through the process. I, that's a beautiful image just of, of the lift. And so there's something around practicing self-compassion as we yeah. go on that journey. Absolutely. And when I went back to therapy, I guess you call it maybe immersion therapy, he would literally take me back to the scene of what was happening and you know when you go back you have all that sting of the energy so I would I have thrown up in sessions I would shake I would cry I would try to run out the room I'd crawl into a little ball and I was so scared of going but there's something in me that has always pulled me towards going that I know that I have to clean this up because it's holding me back you know they didn't kill me I'm living my life but I'm protecting myself from living I wasn't living fully but as the years went by with this kind of last lot of therapy, every time I went back to a different scene and we worked through it, it took the sting out. So it diluted all of that energy attached to it. And now I can speak about it freely. There's no emotional attachment to anything that happens to me at all. I mean, that's incredible. And it does feel brave because it means you've got to have the long game in sight and keep coming back to do a little bit more work, even though your body's retching and you know, reacting in such a dramatic, say you've got to trust that process or that therapist or whatever that might be to move you forward. But what I'm hearing is um, a real message of hope. And so that we don't have to live with these things forever or the way that they hold us back. Um, What advice would you give to to young women or, or people who've been through a traumatic event? What should they focus on? Well, I would say it's never too late to get help, whatever age you are, whenever it happened. Um, but to surround yourself with good people, supportive people, really look after yourself. As if you had a little five-year-old, how how you would look after them, look after yourself. So to nurture yourself, be kind to yourself. Don't do the guilt. Don't do the victim blaming because we're the worst ones to do it to ourselves. I know because I did it for years. You need to stop that. It is never, ever, ever person's fault if they are raped or sexually assaulted or abused in any way. You know, I've been very lucky since I shared my story that doors have opened in so many ways. And one of the most amazing interviews, no offense to you, Petra, I was <laughs> interviewed by Sir Trevor MacDonald. Oh, that's fair. Was, okay, yeah. that was but what took place afterwards was more amazing and showed me why I need to do this. My friend's mother had been listening. And my friend Sandra got in contact to say that she had been listening. To cut a long story short, my friend's 81-year-old mum told her that day that she had been raped. She had never, ever told anyone. So that day, she heard me on the radio, and she ended 64 years of silence. So every time I speak, every time I'm asked to do an interview, go to a conference, share my story, wherever... I think of her and I think of all the men and women that can't find their voice yet. 
So I don't suggest that you speak publicly like me, because I understand that's not for everybody, but find your voice. It doesn't have to be a therapist. Find somebody that you trust and share your story. Don't ever die with that story in you, because my friend is convinced if her mum hadn't heard me, she would have taken her story to the grave, because she believed it was her fault, and whatever I'd said, she told her that she made her, I made her feel differently, that she always thought it was her fault, and she changed her mind. And that is the power that comes of sharing our stories. That is the power that comes with sharing stories. And I, I mean, I'm just emotional thinking of 65 years or, or however long it was. Yeah, it gets me every time. Oh, whew. suffering in silence. And so many people are there. I think that's so the real many. tragedy. Is that and not just stories of rape or sexual assault. In any story that you're ashamed about, the shame is crippling. And it's inappropriate shame. You have nothing to be ashamed about. It's I, shame just and a naive isolation. Thirteen-year-old. Yeah. That's that's what happened. Yeah, but even then, society has something to answer for. But um, I think just when it comes to any of these mental health sort of topics, the the shame and isolation keeps us in our head, so that we just begin torturing ourselves rather than finding help. Yeah. Um, Madeline, I could just cry all day with you. Oh, I wish I wish we could you. hug so as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much for, for your time, your story, your vulnerability. Where can people find your book? Where can they find you if they're interested in your speaking? Oh, so my book is called Unbroken, which you can get on Amazon or any good bookstore. And if they don't have it in, they will order it in for you. And I have a website, madelaineblack.co.uk, or all social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, wherever. Get the on Twitter, story. I think I'm madblack65. I like that, Mad Black. <laughs> the irony, psychotherapist. Yeah. Um, good luck with all your speaking. We'll Thank put all of this so into the, the show notes and we wish you all the best. Thank you.